Welcome to What If So What, the podcast where we ask what's possible with digital, figure out how to make it real in your business. I'm Jim Hertzfeld. And I'm Kim Williams Chopek. We're part of Proficient's digital strategy team. And today we'll ask what if, so what, and most importantly, now what? The Industrial Revolution of the late 1700s resulted in global societal and economic change. But one subtle change that doesn't get a lot of attention is it also separated the act of designing things from the act of making things. And it's not that there wasn't thought put into functionality or the aesthetics of things. It's that until then, artisans and crafters both designed and built the same things, kind of like hipster collectives in Brooklyn do today. Industrial design as we know it is credited to a guy named Raymond Lowy in the 1940s who designed everything from pencil sharpeners to vending machines to NASA spacecraft interiors. And design has come a long way since then. And while it's table stakes for a lot of companies, it's still not quite embraced by technologists. And I would argue still misunderstood by some companies who are excited about the upside of good design and what you can get from a great design, but not really committed to everything that it takes, which is exactly why we thought it would make a great discussion topic for today. We're on with Chris Bernard, VP of UX and Design at CDK Global, a company that makes software for the automotive industry. And I'm really excited to have Chris uh, with us today. Chris, we've, we've known each other for uh, a few years when you were at the Truth Labs, but what I've always been impressed with is, you know, I consider you sort of a lifelong design professional. And uh, I, I've always enjoyed our, our conversations and your insights. We're really excited to have you on today. All right. Jim, thanks for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Super. All right, Chris, let's dive in. So I want to start with, you know, I already mentioned the word design, life, lifelong design guy. You know, I think when we talk about design and it's one of those words that, you know, has a lot of, a lot of connotations or sort of preconceived perspectives. It means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But I think a lot of people sort of in the digital space, certainly in sort of technology in general, maybe the layman just think of like design as visuals of colors, shapes and lines and the very sort of perceptible traits of a product, you know, that's sort of designed to them. But I, I think design is so much more than that. I even think that the layperson, when they think about whether something is designed well or not, if they really think about it, it starts to formulate. But how do you think of design? How do you define design? Sure. Well, well, Jim, design is one of those words that is very loaded and it does mean a lot of different things to different people. It's kind of like engineering, right? I can be an industrial engineer. I can be a mechanical engineer. I can be a biomechanical engineer. I can be a chemical engineer. And I would say design as a discipline has different flavors as well. And, and probably what most lay people are, are most familiar with is the concept of visual or communication design. So it may be the annual report you get in the mail that you look at, or it may be the box um, that you open when you look at an iPhone, right? I mean, and actually an iPhone is a great way to talk about design. When you get a package with your new iPhone in it, um, that box is designed by someone and the unboxing experience and how the phone is wrapped is designed and that's communication design. And then when you actually look at the phone itself and how it's built and how they use aluminum and glass and all the different pieces that make the phone, you would call that industrial design, right? It's designing a physical thing. And I think a lot of us are familiar with that. But then when you turn on the phone and you actually have to register it, right? And you have to log in with your account and maybe restore backups from another phone, um, there's an experience there. And that experience is designed as well. And um, when you look at all of those things together and you start looking at maybe apps that you might buy on the phone, there's usually a design group that had to go in and figure out, well, how's that app going to work? How's it going to look? How's it going to feel? What steps do you have to go through to set it up? All those things are design. And uh, even the words that we put down on the page might be designed to talk you through a process. And these are all different disciplines that, that encompass design, specifically when we start thinking about technology or enterprise or building software. These are all components that we bring to the table. And um, there's actually a few others that we bring to the table too. So there's the concept of research and going out and um, looking at what people are doing, asking what they're doing, seeing what they're doing um, to kind of help inform the design process as well. Everyone's unboxed something I met, right? I love that switch you, you kind of made in my mind where yeah, design went from the sort of very tangible, the unboxing experience to the you know, using the product and then the experience itself. And yeah, it's funny you mentioned Apple because people kind of get excited about, it. again, they have a consumer experience around Apple. You know, I, Apple's done a phenomenal job, great products, you know, and Steve Jobs is iconic. But I, I hear so many companies say, you know, we want to be the Apple and Amazon of our industry, you know, of the food tray 
construction industry, <laughs> you know, it's every ever esoteric sort of corner of the world. But why do you think uh, companies are, are making this investment? Like, where do companies turn the corner? They, you know, they had a traditional business, they've had a product, they, they've kind of done things the same way for many years. But why do you see companies, maybe your company is, is in this camp, why are they investing in adopting design as a core competency? About 10 years ago, when I worked at Microsoft, um, I used to give a talk called Design is the New Black. And in some ways, design has been a very trendy topic in the C-suite, in the executive suite, and in how we talk about shareholders, about creating value. And uh, that's not to diminish it and say that it can't do those things, but by itself, it can't do those things. And I think the real reason that the companies embrace design falls across a number of dimensions. And, and probably the most basic one is um, good design can save you money, or in some cases, it can make you more money. So a, a really good example of that is um, design helps you do the right thing and pick the right path. In that regards, design can save you a lot of money over actually going down the wrong path and spending a lot of money getting down that path and then getting attached to that path and falling in love with that path because you put too much money into it. Design can help you avoid those pitfalls. Um, so I think that's one reason that, that companies embrace design. I think the other reason that companies embrace design is because um, things that work well or that we like or that give us you know, some kind of emotional or physical pleasure um, make us feel better. So design in some ways can um, hide a lot of sins or minimize them because um, things that make us feel good, we like to use more often. And I think even you know that, that green screen application that you might have used in a, a consulting company 10 years ago to book your travel gets really annoying when you go home to a world of um, TikTok and Facebook and, you know, Microsoft Office and, and, and Google Apps and all these things that are really well designed. So I think there's an expectation among people that technology should be friendly and adapt to them. And um, design is a, not the only ingredient, but a pretty important one to be able to accomplish that. Yeah, I love that. So it's sort of the hard economics of it, right? I think that's lost a lot of companies. From a consumer perspective, we have we bring certain expectations of, of design, right? I want my, yeah, I want this uh, product to feel good. I want to feel, you know, it's it's sturdy, it's reliable. You know, I I'm familiar with those as a consumer, but but the economics are are not always clear at all. I think that's true, and I think there's um I think there's different ways um you can think about that, and you can think about design and where it offers value, and um it depends on if you're talking about something that's physical and real or something that's digital and how you think about it. But, you know, one great example is uh, there's, a, there's a wonderful company in the uh, Chicagoland area called WeatherTech, and they make these really amazing floor mats for your car that last forever. In fact, uh, I, I, I don't know if there, if there is a meme or a user group called Buy It Once, I think WeatherTech would be on there. And uh, if you go look at their website and if you go look at their products, you would think, wow, it's, um, you know, I, I don't know if these guys value design a lot or not looking at their website. But when you look at their products and how their products are made, and what the buying process is like and the install process and how they communicate with you. It's a company that thinks about design very carefully and um, it creates tremendous value in what they're bringing, which is basically extruded plastic mats for your car. And they've really used design to elevate the offering and the promise of their product in terms of how they bring it to market. Um, another great example of a, a Chicago land company that's near and dear to me is Weber. Um, you know, Weber makes all these wonderful grills that we've used. You probably had one in your in your patio when you were growing up that your parents used, and you might have one sitting out on your patio today. And um, the amount of design and care that they put into their products results in a product that not only looks beautiful and is super easy to use, but it's super durable. Um, so it creates a lot of value um, for those products and how they work. And then in some cases, we may have products where it's a digital product and we have to sit and use that product all day long. And, um, you know, the frustration of a product that's poorly designed or has little nits and cuts is um, it's kind of like if you're in the kitchen and you, you bang your head on a cabinet and it's your fault, but you just get so angry you want to punch something, right, and react to it. And, and bad design can be little nits and experiences that, that really frustrate us, um, even to the degree that we might not be able to articulate why we're frustrated. But it's just an experience that's thoroughly unpleasant. And if we can make those experiences easier for people, we create people that just feel better about things. And when they feel better about things, they're probably going to feel better about our product. They're probably going to feel better about their job. Um, they're going to feel that somebody cares enough to actually focus on this. And, um, you know, you may even see the experience in a hotel you stay in, right? The level of attention to detail that you might get at a Four Seasons 
versus another hotel might be very different in terms of how they make your bed, how they fold the sheets down, uh, what the, the lobby of the hotel smells like. All these things influence us in different ways, and they're all things that are designed. You asked earlier about companies, you know, do they get it or do they not? I think most companies get that um, design can add value, but I think maybe the industry itself, and I'm, I'm talking about my peers and myself, sometimes we don't articulate the value ourselves very well for what it can bring to the table. And sometimes if we apply the wrong methods um, or the wrong technique or the wrong medium to try to solve some of these problems, it's really easy for design not to solve some of the problems that people have. So a great example of that in the digital world is um, there's a concept, Jim, uh, called dark patterns. Have you ever heard of that concept? I, I think so. Why don't you um, much elaborate on that? Yeah. Dark patterns are... Um, Things that you might do in technology or affordances that um, maybe aren't a great benefit to the end user. So there are certain social media apps that have um, factors in them that want to make you constantly return and use the app. Uh, they generate a, a you know a FOMO, a fear of missing out, and they can drive some really unproductive behaviors um, with how people engage um, and, and use a product. And uh, that, that's an example of a dark pattern, or um, it may encourage me to not understand uh, the privacy settings I'm setting for an experience I'm using, and unwittingly, I'm disclosing a lot more information than I want to to someone. Those things are dark patterns, and um, dark patterns are designed as well, and um, we have to really pay attention to those things and make sure that we're using design in a positive way to interact with the people that are ultimately going to use our products or pay for them. And uh, quite frankly, we don't do that all the time right now. And uh, that's where I think design sometimes can provide value for all the wrong reasons. Um, but then also, I think design, when you're applying the wrong technique to something, um, it's not going to solve the problem. So, uh, you know, one of the examples and the fundamental challenges I think we have in the automotive industry in North America is um, if I went and asked 10 people, what's it like to buy a car? I'm probably not going to hear very good things. It's a pretty stressful, frustrating process people feel like sometimes they're getting hustled in that process. Um, I'm certainly not saying the entire industry is like that, but there are parts of it that are. And um, a great experience in a digital product can't erase that, right? It can't erase the practice of the business or the process by itself. So um, design can help solve a lot of problems, but if there's other intractable things, you know, from a regulatory environment or a legal environment or just a business behavior environment, um, Design can sometimes mask those things, but it can't make them all magically go away. So that's uh, there's so much there, uh, Chris. And um, I'll tell you, I, I'm a weather tech guy. I just want to go back to that for a minute <laughs> because it is it is a it is a great product. And I you know I I probably get a new car every two or three years, and that's the first thing I do is uh, I order my weather tech. So they're not a sponsor of this program, but this podcast. But uh, you know, it, I I can trust it. I I know it's going to work. You know, it's going to make me feel better. And it reminds me of a conversation I had with a carpenter, a contractor friend of mine recently. I was just thinking, it made me think about, you know, the value of, of certain tools. And, you know, I asked why are these tools, are these tools w worth it? Can I go down to the my big box store and just buy a version of this tool for 20 or 30 bucks? Or should I really go the distance and, and, and really get the best version of this that has been machined precisely, that has been tested and uh, and thought through? And, and if you really kind of work to those additional tools, the, they are easier to use. You know, if you work with them, they are truly, you know, produce a better result. They're easier. You fatigue less. You produce a better product. And it kind of goes goes back to the economics. I think there's certainly parallels across the board. So I wonder, um, kind of back to Apple again, I know that, um, you know, they have very iconic sort of design way beyond, beyond Steve Jobs, but just, but just from a, you know, an aesthetic design. And I think... Um, Something I've, I I do encounter with with some of our clients is something I heard of, termed as the Moses myth that you can you're just waiting for Moses to come in and or some heroic figure to come in and and sort of part the Red Sea, and we're sort of waiting for this person to come up and and this is going to be our our way forward. Or there's another theme out there. You, you mentioned dark patterns. I you may have heard of something called the cargo cult. It's kind of an agile anti pattern where if we just go through these certain rituals, it'll just happen. But I think it's it it does take more, right? It does take more than you know setting up sort of design called design theater. Like, hey, we're going to have a room at the lab. We're going to let people wear jeans and t-shirts, and we're going to hire a hero. It, it's so much more than that, right? And you kind of alluded to this with some of these other disciplines around 
research and, and some of the things you hadn't really thought of, or I think a lot of firms don't really think of, but from an organization perspective, an organization that's sort of now buying into this and maybe feels that, like they're a little behind, how do you, how, how do they make it real? Like how does an organization or how did, you know, even your, maybe your experience at CDK, like how do you guys make it real? So I think I'm really fortunate at CDK um, right now because uh, I think we have completely recognized the value of design. It's um, absolutely not recognized in all of our products yet. Uh, that's going to be a journey that, that probably takes us quite a while. But I'm an executive at the company, right? So I have a seat at the table among senior leadership, uh, which is really valuable to companies that want to really push design into their culture. But the reality is a lot of companies don't have that, right? And they don't invest at that level. And I, and I think the way that you make the wheel at companies today evolves around a couple of principles. And the, the, this will be kind of a complex dialogue, but I'll, I'll try to chunk it out into pieces. I think the first area that you have to work on is that um, the leadership of design um, that's, that's going to be the most impactful in an organization is impa- uh, influenced leadership. Rarely does command and control work where you say, this is our new vision guy, and he's in charge of the design for all our products. Well, that guy's going to be really unpopular or that woman's going to be really unpopular if they just go around and say, I'm in charge of all of this and I'm going to fix it. You have to build and cultivate relationships. It's just like succeeding in high school to a large degree. So I think that's the first piece that designers need to understand is that you have to influence by leadership and uh, it's just not going to be given to you and that you earn that over time. And the two most important skills that can help you do that better over time are kind of fundamental, but they're really important in the enterprise. And that's how you communicate, both in a written format, because if you can't write it down and you can't put the words around it, you probably can't articulate it beyond that. And then also how you communicate with others and how you interact with others and um, the environment you create for success. There's a book that uh, we're reading on my leadership team now that my boss gave me called The Culture Code, which I'm sure many listeners are familiar with. And uh, it's really about creating a safe environment and being vulnerable and understanding that not everybody has all the answers and that even I will make mistakes sometimes as well. And uh, that you're not expecting people to be infallible um, as you go through this process. What you're trying to do is reduce the cost of mistakes and you're trying to increase the learning from mistakes that you make along the way. And the third piece of this that I think is the most important is understanding that even in the world of design, I think there's a bit of a civil war going on right now. That's a strong word, maybe too pejorative, and there's, there's too much emotion in that word, but there's a battle that's going on. And um, the battle is that many designers, especially um, mid to senior level designers, are going through a, um, a process where they were educated in a very specific way on how to apply design, which is very waterfall-like, um, which is you've got a plan, you've got a research, you've got to synthesize, you've got to converge, you've got to diverge, um, and this will take six months or 12 months, and then you know what to build. So you go build it. Nobody really practices design that way in the enterprise, at least not most people that I encounter. And you also see most companies trying some attempt at agile to bring products forward. So design has really evolved towards a toolkit where we use all the same tools and we use all the same processes, but we use them in a much more accelerated way. And I think where this really came to light is some of the work um, that was done by Jake Knapp when he was at Google Ventures and he wrote the book Google Sprint which really um, is a book about design thinking. And it's about compressing the design thinking process um, into something they used to run in five days. And uh, if you follow the discipline of the sprint and how it's evolved since that book was published, there's some formats that have blown it out to last a little bit longer, like maybe more like a month. But the goal is really about making smart, insightful bets and getting those things out in front of the hands of your consumers or your stakeholders to get the feedback quickly and um, actually start taking feedback in real time to kind of evolve your products over time. So where before I think research was critically important and time was critically important, I think today it's about efficiency of process and it's about what are the tools at scale that we can build that can help us make better decisions. So, you know, looking at the evolution of web analytics into product analytics and eventing and tools so I can um, instrument my products to give me feedback and data on how people use things are really important. Um, We haven't quite seen it yet in design, but when you look at what machine learning models and AI will bring to the design process, um, there might be certain design iterations that we can automate through a learning model in the future. And it's it's a concept called computational design. And I think those are aspects that are really going to fuel how we work in the future. And um, I'm not sure that education has quite caught up with that yet. Yeah, that's, gosh, you, you 
covered so much ground that gets into organizational dynamics and communication and you know education and experience and i just you know i hear design thinking a lot too but the you know what i love too about the google design sprint is you know it just it, it makes it so so practical and actionable and I, I i still encounter teams that we just just talked about this in another episode where you know there's a there's a feeling of risk and uncertainty in the in the the response is this i call it a design science project let's spend a few months sorting this out and then we'll know but there's just no substitute for actual customer and user feedback that's what's exciting about those approaches and i i see that catching on quite a bit you know i just don't see the the time to market appetite because it's it's six months to figure out what i might design might design right and then we start learning about the project and nobody nobody has six months these days especially this year i have done projects just like you defined where i come back at the end of those six months and i look at this and I look at our outputs, which I'm really proud of, but then I say, you know what? The market kind of moved without us in that amount of time. And what we have is no longer valid. So so I think I think speed is important, but I think it's probably important to caveat again for some of our listeners that, you know, there are different types of design and innovation as well. And, um, you know, normally innovation can fall into kind of three buckets. The easiest, although I don't think any innovation is easy, is what I call evolutionary innovation, right? And that's that's probably what most of us make our day doing is, you know, the incremental improvements to a product um, that we can add over time or a service. And then you have evolutions, right? And evolutions might be work where you're having, you know, monolithic applications to install on a computer that maybe become a, a SaaS offering that's a web service. And then you have what we call revolutionary design, right? Which is really upending an entire business model in a world. The techniques for revolutionary design are different than some of those other techniques that you, I would think, need for kind of the evolutionary cycles that you run through in any company. And, um, you know, often when we think of Apple, we think of, um, you know, that revolutionary design. And in some cases, it's what I would call genius design. I mean, they, they were very fortunate that they had Steve Jobs and they had Joni Ive there that, that, that could really see that future and articulate it. And, you know, in that case, if they went out and asked customers what they wanted, they wouldn't be able to articulate it, probably. Um, so that's a big challenge, too. And there's that old funny joke, you know, they tell in automotive circles about Henry Ford, where if he asked what people wanted, they would have said a faster horse. But I think that's true in technology, too. Nobody, nobody ever asked for the iPhone, really. It, you know, it took that vision to kind of articulate and paint that picture for a consumer in a way that they understood. I would say Apple probably wasn't even the first to try to do that, right? They were just the first ones that were successful doing it at scale. There's a different set of tools and techniques um, for all of those things that you have to think about. So, Chris, um, we, we could go on for another few hours, but I, I just want to say nobody asked for the iPhone either. That's the title of your book. I just you can. OK, yeah, you can. I will. You, I'm going to write that down. You're right. That, 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 that is that is good. You can take it and run with it. Chris, this is so insightful. I, I appreciate the time today. It's so great to catch up. I think we may have to continue this again someday. But uh, let me let me put you on the spot, though. Just uh, one one design element from this year you'd like to share. Favorite design element, favorite design, favorite designer. I know there are designers out there listening. What's your, uh, we'll call it design of the year. Let me think about that for a second. Um, you know, the, the year of 2020 and the year of COVID, you know, for many of us that are fortunate has been a world where we, we have the opportunity to work at home. And um, that opportunity comes with caveats in that you're spending a lot of time using technology to communicate and interact with people. And uh, one of the things that I really appreciated um, this year was how some companies really thought about how they can humanize technology a little bit more and make it easier for all of us to work together. I love the evolution of products like Zoom. Um, if you look at what Zoom was in February of last year and you look at what it is today, it's evolved so dramatically in so many ways. And some of those ways are focused on product quality and security and, you know, the, the needs of the enterprise. But they also focused on whimsical things like, uh, you know, Jim, if you and I wanted to have a meeting, we could both have little mustaches that look perfect on our face if we if we skipped Movember. And those things kind of humanize the product and the appeal. There's um, another company out there called Elgato. And Elgato makes a lot of products for people that um, use Twitch and live stream while they play games. And I found Elgato products are really great for me in all the Zoom meetings that I have to sit in and that I have to work with people every day. 
So I have a, a set of Wi-Fi controlled lights that are set up in my computer. I have a little mixer that can control my audio and my microphones. And um, it sounds really silly, but it allows me to make a deeper connection with the people I work with because they can see me clearly and I'm looking straight at them and I'm well lit. And um, I have a green screen behind me. I can put myself anywhere in the world and it surprisingly looks amazingly good. These are little design things that really elevate the way that I can communicate and interact with people in a pretty trying environment. I think, you know, what I've been most impressed about is how um, the industry and the world has kind of quickly evolved to kind of service that. And um, I can't wait till I don't have to use it, to be quite honest. But um, for now, while I do have to use it, it is something that uh, I think has really impacted me greatly this year. And then I would say at home, a lot of us that, again, if you are fortunate enough that you can do your job from home as you go through this, things like mesh networking and, you know, the increase in broadband speeds in many areas of the United States um, have all made this possible. And um, I think we'll look back on it and be a little surprised how smoothly it worked for some of us because we never thought that we were going to enter an environment like this. These industries and the technology wasn't built to support it, but it all adapted and it helped us be successful and it helped us get through a lot of this. That's that's great. I can identify with all those examples. Well, Chris, um, again, thanks so much for sitting down with us and sharing your perspective. I know I know you'd go in a lot of direction. I didn't expect WeatherTech and Weber, but uh, great call outs. So um, let's, uh, let's try and do this again. Jim, thank you so much for the time. I really appreciate it. Now it's time for our namesake segment. What if, so what, and most important, now what? Hey, Kim, welcome back. Hey, Jim. So Kim, um, you know, aside from having a fantastic voice, right? Chris, uh, Chris had a lot to say, and I, you know, I, I really, I think we'll have him back because I think uh, there's just so much more ground to cover. It was a pretty din- dense, um, uh, I think, exchange. So, what uh, a lot of things, but what kind of left out or, uh, for you? Yeah, that was a great conversation, and um, yeah, dense is the right word for it. Yeah. There was a lot to in think about. Way. In the best way. Yeah, in the yeah. in the very best way. In the very best way. Yes, and I could listen to his voice for hours and hours. Um, it really resonated, obviously, as you talked about in your opening. At the value uh, proposition of design is out there. It's growing. I liked his his notion. He he didn't say it in so many words, but you know, doing design right can actually help avoid sunk costs. But you have to follow the right approaches, and I have I have a lot of thoughts on that. I'm sure you do too. I I thought it was pretty funny. I, I think he was being very kind. I I love when he said the, the the mid to senior level designers, which I think is just a nice way of yeah. saying older designers. Uh, yeah. Well. <laughs> um, you know, uh, are, we're trained in a certain way or in a certain discipline, and they're so insistent on following waterfall processes and this notion of it has to be pixel perfect, and I can't show you something until I think it's ready, mm-hmm. and it just can't work like that anymore. And, and and I think we've seen it, and he's right. You know, when you think like that, the market moves without you, and and that's what we have to we have to get away from. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad he worked that in there, Kim, because it's such cliche. Time is money, and you know, we used to talk about just the value of getting something to market quickly, just so you can make money off of it, right? <laughs> so you can recoup your investment. But I think what was coming up was actually that's true. Yeah. You can you want to monetize your work, but the world's changing, right? Even in six months, you know, those those needs are going to change, and I think that's more compelling. Right. And how do you how do you really adjust to that? And and that, you know, tends to be more of a culture change. But you know, I think maybe his implication is maybe younger designers, you know, who haven't been trained in, uh, I'll just say dogma, you know, that the, they are a little bit more flexible. And this notion of the the design sprint that he talked about, you know, the, the, the broader design thinking and how that's actually operationalized. I've used the Google design sprint methodology in a product company. I love it. I loved it. It forced designers, technologists, product managers totally out of their comfort zone it made them, it forced them to see their their intended users in, in live, real action. It helped them really move away from that goal of pixel perfectness. I, I can't speak highly enough for kind of, I, I'd say forcing that, you know, in smaller chunks with, with certain teams to see if, if, if you can really move the needle on, on how companies think about design and how they really think about placing the value on certain processes. 
so I'm overanalyzing the phrase pixel perfect and I'm trying to figure out what's wrong with that. And is it <laughs> right? Is it perfection? Cause I think it's perfection, right? Like perfect, perfect is the enemy of good. And, yes, and yes. Um, right. That's and right. so there's, there's a flaw, but then I think about pixel, you know, is, is the visual, the aesthetic. Right. And I think that's also underlies some of the flaws here because I think one of my big takeaways was uh, Chris got out onto this right away was that design is many different things. And I know we've, we've, we've talked about this and I've written about this, you know, that, you know, that is way beyond the aesthetics. And he, he opened up with talking about the different types of design, communication design and industrial design and experience, even getting down to the, the unboxing, by the way, you know, we recently, we, we just came out of the holidays as, as of this recording. I had a couple great unboxing experiences, right? <laughs> to, to the, well, it makes a difference, it, right? It, and, yeah, and he's right. Yeah. You know, all the different types of design, but I think you're right. It's this notion. Let's let's think about pixel perfect more broadly. It, it's not just about the aesthetics. It's it's exactly like you said. You can't let perfect stand in the way of good. Um, that's the whole notion behind agile. Right. Right. Well, and then bringing you know bringing and we're seeing this more and more, especially under you know we've talked about this in our our episode with Jeff Small around product management, right? It is a this merging of of agile and design thinking, and the, how those those loops converge and, and merge together. And I think it just goes back to businesses becoming the design and IT are not two different departments. Businesses become digital. This has to be a core competency. You know, design is a especially customer experience design is just uh, it, it's it's got to be a core competency uh, in, in every business. You know, so we're dealing with this battle between waterfall and lean, but you know, it's not a battle between two teams, the IT team and the and the design team. I sometimes I feel like it's friction between both of those teams and where businesses need to be, right? They both need to evolve. Right. Because theoretically their goal is the same. Bring a good product to market, make our users happy. But how we get there, how we're measuring, how we're placing values, how we're staffing teams, what what are the skill sets, all of that kind of leads to that internal friction. And and really, I think ultimately the delay in achieving those goals. So Kim, you did, yeah, speaking of friction, I, it makes me think of the what if for this episode. So if you don't mind, let me jump into that. Because I think my what if, you know, if you think about design and I'm thinking about how as an organization, design becomes my core competency. To, for me to buy into that, I have to ask, start asking, what would I be? What could I do? What could I be differently? What, what What is the what if of good design? I think of it in sort of three competing questions that belie this friction. And this kind of comes from IDEO's three lenses of innovation. I know you've heard this, the balance between desirability, viability, and feasibility. And I feel like it's so brilliant. It's just so fundamental to me. That's such a fantastic explanation. But with great design, you could manage these three questions. You could ask really three what if questions. Like what if you could give customers exactly what they need? I think design helps us understand and expose what the customers need. Secondly, what if you could give the business what it wants, right? It wants, it wants, you know, it has to make sense. Well, you know, is it viable? Will it make money? <laughs> Not just desirable by our customers. Is it viable? And then, you know, lastly, like, w what if you could actually build it? Is it feasible? You know, can you do it? Is it technically possible? I think good design discipline, good experience design discipline. I've seen this on teams and on projects that I think have done a really good job of, of adopting design, really ingesting it into the, into the approach. Those are the three what ifs that they're resolving. So, so what? So what is that? So what if you could do that, Kim? Well, no. So let's think about how you might accomplish those what ifs, because I think there are good what ifs and those principles of innovation are the underpinnings. First of all, as Chris mentioned, research is key to the design process, and that's often overlooked. It's important for identifying not only what customers need, but who they are. And that's going to help you answer, you know, what if you could give customers exactly what they need? You can't figure that out without research. And I've seen Plenty of product managers, uh, you know, design products and guide teams based on their opinion. Um, and ultimately, that's a failure. And, uh, you know, Chris made another good point that I'll bring up here. Design needs a seat at the senior leadership table. And while I agree with Chris's assertion that uh, good design leadership comes through influence, communication, interaction, I still think too many designers are missing the data and the proof points. It's, it's really 
uh, uh, you know, and maybe these are these mid to senior level <laughs> designers, but there has to be a why behind the design. There has to be data. There has to be a benchmark that you're looking at. Um, and this can come through research, but designers have to get better about being comfortable about thinking a little bit more about that monetization, that tracking, reporting results, picking a data point, and really working with the team to design against that. And implicitly, uh, you know, and this is a bigger conversation, I really think that if you're a product company, you need to be product-led. And I'm contrasting that with with, uh, marketing-led or sales-led. It's an organizational model, but it really allows you to address the first two what-ifs. A company you know, that is product led, like WeatherTech and Weber are successful because they can address those what ifs and and allows them to be agile and respond to their customer needs without worrying about sales implications or marketing implications directly because they're innovating their product based on customer needs and not necessarily based on a sales goal or marketing goal. What do you think? I, 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 that that just feels to me like as I was listening to Chris and thinking about the conversation, I love the WeatherTech and the Weber examples. They're product-led companies. Yeah, yeah. I'm a fan of both. I'm a customer of both. I uh, heard. Yeah. You really well, buy new WeatherTech? We, well, I guess you I do. have to, right? You, they, yeah, they cut do. measure everything. It's That's the first amazing. thing. It's the first thing I do. Like it, like that day. Uh, I've had my my current vehicle for two years, and it's the first thing I did. It's amazing. But I mean, you know, these are all big things, but what, like, what could you do today? You can't change, you know, your company from being marketing led to product led. You can't, you know, decide to train all your designers on Google Analytics tomorrow. I mean, you could, but I mean, these are bigger changes. Yeah. And that's, you know, like we said in the beginning, it was just, there was such a density of, <laughs> of thought in our interview. I thought a lot about this because there's so many things that I, I want to do. And, and you're, you're right. Influence, influence takes a lot of time, right? And it's changing hearts and minds, right? Or winning hearts and minds. But I think one of the things that we've, we've said this, you know, sort of bigger change management strategies, Kim, right? We say, even with all the research and the great in, in design, there's got to be proof. You know, research is great, but another element of research is testing, right? And getting that feedback. And, and, and that's the proof that people need when people see that, wow, that, that team really embraced a great balance of design and agile and, and testing and research, you know, and, and it works. They, you know, they want to know how it happened. So I think, you know, one of the things that I, I'm going to jump on the sprint bandwagon too. I think that's one thing I think people can do. And I want to leave people with kind of one, one challenge. Take a use case and give yourself five days. What can you do with it? You know, I think, you know, adopting a Google Sprint or what we call a uh, proficient, a CX AMP, how do you adopt that in five days? How do you take an idea, figure out what customers want, build some some basic empathy, prototype it, test and share it, try to make it work in, in some way, get more feedback and, and see see what you learned on Friday afternoon that's different than what you assumed on, on Monday morning. I think that's an exercise that, that everybody can do. Dip your toe in that water. And I think it will change hearts and minds. I, I really believe that. And I've, I've seen it work. You know, and the other thing, it's fun, right? I just think it's, it's just more enjoyable. So I think, uh, I think that's the now what. To get out there five days, try it out. You won't regret it. Just like this interview. <laughs> Which we could talk for five days, but uh, uh, anyway, thanks, Kim, and um, we're gonna do this again. Yeah, let's go. Let's go do a design sprint. Yeah, let's go. It's, it's <laughs> Wednesday here, but you know we got a couple days. We'll do That's it. That's right. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Jim. You've been listening to What If So What with Jim Hertzfeld and Kim Williams Chopek. Subscribe to the podcast to make sure you don't miss a single episode. You can find this season along with show notes at proficient.com. We're also on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon, Google, and other major podcast platforms. Thanks for listening.